Hey, this is God's Hat for the Sad Truth. Many of you who follow my work are familiar with my application of evolutionary psychology to consumer behavior, uh, more generally uh, the application of evolutionary principles in various uh, business disciplines and in various contexts where uh, human behavior, human preferences, human desires are explored. But of course, evolutionary theory uh, has made strong inroads uh, in many disciplines. Uh, and so one of the things that I've done in several of my writings, uh, most notably in my 2007 book, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, and then in a subsequent uh, edited special issue, which I'll talk about in a second, I've tried to list all of the various disciplines where the infusion of Darwinian thinking has uh, occurred. And so what I thought I would do today is just discuss some of these for you. So here is the, let me just flip to the next page. So this is a table from, uh, as I said, my book, uh, my 2007 book, table 2.3 on page 57 and 58. And what I do in, on that, in that table is I list a very, very broad range of disciplines that are now, you know, infused with evolutionary thinking. So let me just kind of go through them very quickly. You could, now, these are uh, citations that, uh, of course, haven't been updated because this is a book that is now uh, almost 11 years, well, it is 11 years old now, we're in 2018, this, was, this book came out in 2007. So biopolitics, uh, also evolutionary politics, how do you apply evolutionary principles in the study of uh, politics. So for example, uh, the fact that we prefer candidates who have certain morphological features that are linked to uh, evolutionary based uh, preferences, that would be one application of evolutionary theory in biopolitics. There's the field of bioeconomics, and there's actually a journal titled Journal of Bioeconomics. I've uh, published a paper in that journal. There's Darwinian based law, and I actually discuss Darwinian based law in chapter one of the current book that you're looking at, the 2007 book, where I look at Hammurabi's code or specific codes within the more general Hammurabi's code that are very much informed, uh, up, you know, informed of, by evolutionary theory. Now, of course, in Hammurabi's time, they, they may have not used the term, well, they didn't use the term evolutionary theory, but they certainly were well aware of our evolved human nature. And so some of the codes in question reflect a very good understanding of our shared biological heritage. There's evolutionary game theory, which of course is used by uh, theoretical biologists. It is used by game theorists and other uh, economists when they are modeling different uh, dynamics using evolutionary principles. There's a field of neuroeconomics that in some cases has some evolutionary thinking infused within it. There's evolutionary archeology, span evolutionary architecture, Right? There, all sorts of uh, animals are wonderful architects and their architectural abilities are very much part of their uh, phylogenetic history. This is very much in line with what Richard Dawkins refers to as uh, an animal's extended phenotype. Uh, and so there's a whole field now of evolutionary architecture. Biomimetics, I talked about this in a recent uh, Sad Truth uh, this is where you go out into nature and you try to mimic biological solutions that have arisen via uh, evolution and try to mimic it uh, synthetically by humans. There's the field of evolutionary developmental psychology, evolutionary social psychology, evolutionary cognitive neuroscience, Darwinian ecology, Darwinian agriculture, ecological economics. Now, of course, I could spend a whole episode on each of these and maybe at some point I will. Uh, perhaps if you'd like you can comment in the comment section about some of the ones that you find particularly intriguing and I'll try to put together eventually a sad truth clip on them. Darwinian sociology, oh my goodness, even in the uh, the world of sociology which regrettably is very much infected by uh, all sorts of ideological movements that are perfectly removed from science, uh, some people have tried to introduce Darwinian thinking within sociology. There's actually a great 
a book by uh, Lopriato and Crippen titled Crisis in Sociology that precisely addresses this issue. Evolutionary anthropology, of course, that's something that you might expect. In anthropology, you really have an interesting break between, say, cultural anthropologists and uh, bioanthropologists. Uh, and the way that they typically vary is very much in terms of how much they accept and appreciate the fact that uh, humans are endowed with uh, an evolved human nature. Evolved not in the sense that it's superior, evolved meaning in the Darwinian sense that, that, that we are, our human minds are the product of evolutionary forces. Human behavioral ecology, I've talked about it in the past. This is the field that tries to look at why, for example, cross-cultural differences arise. And they arise precisely because humans are endowed with behavioral plasticity. We, we, we can adapt to different environments. Our capacity to adapt is itself an adaptation. Darwinian medicine is a field that I've discussed in the past uh, on several occasions. I even had one of the pioneers of Darwinian medicine on uh, this show, Randy Nesse. You should definitely check out our chat. Darwinian psychiatry uh, and Darwinian clinical psychology in general is, the, is, is where you apply uh, evolutionary principles to guide your understanding of uh, psychiatric and psychological disorders. Evolutionary health promotion, <coughs> excuse me, this is the idea that to, to truly understand health and to truly design uh, policy measures that try to promote health, it is ultimately a good idea to understand how our bodies and minds have evolved. Uh, and so I'm on the editorial board, I'm a uh, consulting editor uh, of, of a new journal called uh, Progress in Preventive Medicine. Uh, I represent the general field of evolutionary psychology in that particular journal. And of course, the idea is that to understand uh, health, uh, you know, um, preventive medicine, we ultimately have to infuse our understanding of the human body, of the development of diseases, via an evolutionary lens. That's, so that's very much linked to Darwinian medicine, if you like. Genetic programming and evolutionary computation, this is the application of evolutionary principles uh, in programming and computation. There's a fantastic book by Koza, some very, very deep stuff there that looks at uh, genetic algorithms, really unbelievable stuff. Neural Darwinism applies uh, the ideas of selection within an individual, within its own brain. This is Gerald Edelman's work. Darwinian gastronomy, I've talked about it in the past. Basically, why is it that some cultures have evolved spicy foods versus others that haven't? Why are some foods more uh, meat-based versus vegetable-based? Uh, and so on and so forth. Literary Darwinism, the application of evolutionary principles in engaging in an analysis of literature. I've talked about this in the past. A few more fields here. This is the continuation of that table in my 2007 book, Evolutionary Musicology. Uh, does does music uh, is music an adaptation or is it an exaptation? Is it some is, is music something that piggybacks on evolved mechanisms that uh, evolved for different purposes, or is there an adaptive function uh, for music itself? Evolutionary ethics and morality. Uh, I've been mired in several. Uh, discussions over the past few days regarding animal rights, animal welfare, and more generally over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about how, of course, we could study morality from a scientific and evolutionary perspective. So there's a whole field called evolutionary ethics and evolutionary morality. Evolutionary epistemology, this is the idea that knowledge itself is selected, is retained, and, and so that ideas follow a, uh, a process in terms of how they are uh, how they win out or lose out, and that process is itself an evolutionary one. Evolutionary aesthetics is the study of, uh, well, aesthetics, for example, why is it that we prefer certain types of uh, images, for example, if they have symmetry or not. And so the field of aesthetics uh, could be infused with Darwinian principles. Simonton, Dean Simonton, very interesting guy, professor of psychology at University of California, Davis, wrote a great book on uh, Darwinian creativity. 
And so creativity itself could be construed as a form of Darwinian process. I highly recommend you check it out. Mimetic theory, you know, the idea of memes originally as developed by uh, Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene. Memes are the cultural analog of the gene. Uh, so a meme could be a slogan, an idea, a belief that spreads from brain to brain. Uh, when you read my books, I am infecting your brains with my memes. Uh, when you listen to the show, same thing is happening. And so memes are, as I said, the cultural analog of the gene. And so some people have looked at, uh, since we are both a biological and cultural animal, how do memes spread within networks? And does that spread, uh, is it best understood uh, via, uh, you know, an evolutionary process? Gene culture coevolution is also, I think, something that, that I've talked about uh, on at least, I think, one or more sad truth clips. So, for example, the distribution of the gene uh, that allows you to either uh, synthesize and process lactose or not is very much linked to uh, whether your culture has engaged in pastoral living or not. And if it has engaged in pastoral living, then there are selection pressures for you to evolve the gene that allows you to synthesize uh, lactose. And so uh, if you map uh, the distribution of that gene with pastoral living, then you, you, you'll you see some very interesting findings. And so this basically argues that there is, if you like, a feedback loop between genes and culture co-evolution. Cultural practices can create a particular environment that makes it more advantageous for certain uh, genes to be selected or not. And so that's, there's a feedback loop. So those are some of the you know, very broad range of disciplines that I listed in my 2007 book. And then later in, in my, uh, in a special issue in the journal Futures, this was a special issue that I had been asked to guest edit on the futures of evolutionary psychology. Uh, in my introductory uh, article to that special issue, I had, if you'd like, updated, I'd come up with uh, a broader range of disciplines uh, that have been Darwinized, sort of to add to the 2007 table that I just uh, listed for you. And, and so here on the right-hand side, you'll see some of the references. So let me just mention these. These are listed them in uh, uh, alphabetical order. So aesthetics and art, agriculture, animal husbandry, of course, and animal husbandry, instead of nature being the selector, it's the breeder who is serving as the artificial selector, hence artificial selection. Anthropology, archaeology, architecture, of course, biology, biomimetics, business sciences, and that's why you see me here sad, uh, computer science, consumer behavior, again, that's uh, me, creativity, criminology. Some of you might remember that the book that set me off on my professional journey was when I was a first year uh, doctoral student, first semester actually, at Cornell University. And I read the book by Daly and Wilson titled Homicide, where they applied evolutionary psychology to study patterns of criminality. And so that was the book that really uh, gave me the idea to then uh, develop the field of evolutionary consumption. Even dance has been studied from an evolutionary perspective. Design, dietetics, and nutrition, that seems to make uh, obvious sense that to, to study uh, our diets and our nutrition requires that we understand how our bodies have evolved. Ecology, economics, even education, social justice warrior central has been infused with evolutionary ideas. Engineering, epistemology, ethics, family studies, futurology, the study of the future has been infused with evolutionary theory. Some of these were already listed in the previous table. Some of these, some of them are, have not. So gastronomy, I've already talked about health promotion, history. So Darwinian history excuse me again, uh, Laura Betzik is a Darwinian historian. You might want to check out her work. So she looks at uh, history via an evolutionary lens, immunology, international relations, law, which I've already talked about, linguistics, literary studies, medicine, morality, musicology, neurosciences, nursing, pharmacology, physics. Lee Smolin, some of you may remember that I had the theoretical physicist uh, Lee Smolin on, he basically argues for natural selection at the cosmological level. So that's an unbelievable idea. So imagine that there are these sort of multiple universes. And so selection operates 
uh, across these uh, different universes at the cosmological level, not at, say, the gene level. So it's a very interesting and intriguing idea. Physiology, political science, psychiatry, public administration, public policy, religious studies. Now, that's a really interesting one because, uh, of course, typically we pit religion against, re against evolution, but the evolutionary roots of religion is itself a very worthy scientific pursuit, and I've certainly written about it in several of my books. And I even had Pascal Boyer, who is one of the uh, pioneers of studying uh, religion from an evolutionary perspective. I had him on my show, so you might want to check our chat out. Uh, Darwinian security uh, is something that's been studied. Uh, regrettably, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, Sagarin passed away tragically at a young age, but he's one of the guys, or maybe the guy, who really revolutionized the idea of applying Darwinian theory to security issues. And as I said earlier, sociology and urban design. So the reason why I'm sharing all of uh, these different applications of or places where evolutionary theory has been applied is to, to give you a sense that really whenever you are studying anything involving biological organisms, whether they be the human organism uh, or uh, some other uh, species, you ultimately can't have a full, complete and accurate understanding of the phenomenon in question uh, whilst uh, negating the fact that uh, any biological organism ultimately is endowed with its own phylogenetic history. And so it's not as though we can't make progress in medicine or business or sociology or psychology without evolutionary theory. Of course, most people conduct their research completely oblivious to an understanding of evolution. That's fine. But by introducing evolutionary theory, it simply augments your explanatory power. And this speaks to the point of the difference between proximate and ultimate explanations. Proximate explanations explain the how and what of a phenomenon, whereas ultimate explanations explain the Darwinian why. So there you have it, folks. I mean, I my, my goal in sharing this clip is to uh, at least excite you to the innumerable ways by which uh, we could be uh, better equipped to understand the phenomenon using evolutionary theory. The Darwinian train has left the, the station all aboard. Wish you all a great week. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Ciao.